presence is heaven to me. Father, we thank you and we praise you for an awesome time of worship where we can come into your presence and submit to you our very being. God, we know who we are because you created us. So God, we ask right now that you would examine us and if you find anything in us that doesn't represent what you created. God, we ask you to cast it out now. Purify our hearts. Make us vessels of honor. God, we thank you for it. Thank you, God, for your deliverance. Thank you for your healing. Thank you, God, for right standing with my brothers and sisters. And God, we thank you for your soon return of your son. And we give you praise for it now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, hallelujah. The presence is heaven to me. Thank you, Father. This morning, I want to go into something that I believe is a interest to everybody. First Peter. First Peter. Now we can do this today because we've got Jesus resurrected, right? Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. First Peter chapter four. First Peter chapter four. I'm going to begin reading at verse 12, even though I'm going to only minister about four or five Verses. Somebody says it's only four or five of them. <laughs> okay. Verse 12 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy if you are reproached for the name of Christ. Blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. Boy, that's good there. That's good. I tell you what. Mm. Verse 15 says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read that again. Amen. <laughs> but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other matters. People's matters. Amen. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, Amen. but let him glorify God in this matter. Here it is. This is the one that hurts. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Amen. And if it begins with us first, what will the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God. Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as, a, as to a faithful creator. Amen. Amen. I want to give you this thought today. Now, I had my son to shorten the title, but I'm going to give you the full title. <laughs> uh, his, his shortness of it, which is the brevity that we can digest is suffering, position or disposition. My original title is, 
Is your suffering the result of your position or disposition? Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I'll explain it. <laughs> Amen. Now, the reason that, that we, we have the short title is because you need to remember it's either your position or, as a Christian or your disposition as an evildoer or a body, busybody that will determine how you grow and develop as a saint. Amen? Now, now you need to understand that the scripture is very clear. It says that, that there are two kinds of things that come to uh, believers. One is a fiery trial, a fiery trial. That's designed to make you grow. In other words, we have the storms of life that are common to everybody. Amen? Amen. But then the Bible also talks further down about a fiery judgment. And this is what Brother Jones talks about every Sunday. This is hell. Amen. Okay, yeah, I'm about to talk about hell this morning. Not that you didn't already talk about it probably at home, but that's okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the Bible says then that the fiery judgment is the final judgment and the fiery trial is the process of development of the saints. So if we look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, the Bible says, uh, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, and this is our reminder, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So no matter what you're going through, you need to be do, going through it right because you don't know if today is the day. Amen. Are you? Yes, good. The Bible also says this, that, that judgment will begin at the house of God. Now you can take that literally or you can take it figuratively. And people choose to do one or the other because it makes it easier for them. If you say it's the church, then it makes it easier for you because you say he's talking about them, not me. But then Paul wrote this. He said, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? So the way you get church is by you being church with the rest of us. <laughs> Are you following me? So if judgment begins at the house of God, it begins not only in the church proper, but also in the church you. Amen. Are you with me? So this brings us to a place where I want to go through three questions today. And if you can get the right answer to each of the questions, you'll be OK. Uh, but I don't think that most of us have the right answers. The first question is, why am I suffering? How many have asked that? Everybody. Second question is, am I ashamed of Christ? Sometimes. I'm answering for you because this is how you answer. That was real silent. You're never ashamed of Christ, right? Even when you're cussing somebody out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the third question, of course, is, am I seeking the loss? I'm going to go through each one of these. Because that's what we were called to do, right? Yeah. All right. So let's do the first question first. Why am I suffering? Oh, my God, if I had a nickel for every time I heard a saint complain, I don't understand why I got to go through this ratchet. This don't make no sense. I got saved and I'm still going through. Thank God. Because if you got saved and you didn't move, you're the biggest hypocrite on the planet. So the Bible, says, <laughs> the Bible says here that those who live righteous must suffer persecution. 
Then it says here in Peter, don't think it's strange because you're being tried. How else would you know you are a Christian if you weren't tried? Hmm? Hmm? Oh, okay. So a Christian sharing in the suffering of Christ will result in four things. First, you have joy with Christ. You know, the Bible says in 1 Peter 1 and 6, I don't want to read all these scriptures, it says, in this you greatly rejoice. Then it says there's fellowship with him in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. It says that you may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Do you know what fellowship of his sufferings mean? Fellowship of his suffering? Fellowship of his suffering? I'm suffering with him. So all you have to do is take a look back, and since we're just right at Easter, everything that you've read about what Christ went through, you have to, you, you are fellowship with, of that suffering. Amen? And then it goes uh, uh, one step further, and it says, being glorified with him, and Romans chapter 8 and verse 17 says that if indeed we suffer with him, I'm jumping in the middle of the scripture, it says if we indeed suffer with him, we may also be glorified together. In other words, what Paul is saying here is that if you are not suffering, you will get no glory. The whole process of suffering is bringing you to a place of glorification. We say that's the ultimate goal for a saint is to be glorified with Christ. That means that he's got to do some, uh, I hate to say it this way, but he's got to do some plastic surgery on us. So, so, we, so we look like him. Okay, all right. Then he said in uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 that we will be reigning with him. If, in, if we endure, uh, 1 Timothy 2 and 12, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will also deny us. Now, every time we, quote, take a break from Christ, we deny him. Wait a minute. Hold on. You, what are you saying? I'm saying that if you can't continue in this thing, every time you have a, I was going to say a psychotic break, but I don't. <laughs> but, 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 but when you have a carnal break, it is a psychotic break because you lose your mind. And every time you do this, what do you say to Christ? You don't have the power to keep me. Every time you doubt, you say, you don't have the power to keep me. Every time you lie, you say, you don't have the power to keep me. Come on, every time you cheat, every time you steal his money, every time you steal his women, his men, you're saying, you don't have the power to keep me. And every time we do this, the Bible says, that what we do is we deny him, and then he has to deny us. Mm. That hurt, didn't it? Well, if you're honest, it did. <laughs> but Peter goes one step further in this. Now, here's what Peter says. Peter says that if you are a Christian, a professing Christian, and you are going through trials, he said that when you go through these trials, it changes your countenance. You know that a saint is suffering for righteous sake when they have the glow of God on their face. The Holy Spirit is reflecting through a person who's going through certain trials. What does that mean? That means that when you come against me and I can still smile. Come on. And as I like to say, <laughs> before I was fully committed, the fact that I didn't hurt any of y'all. <laughs> that's that smile you see on my face. That's the glory of God being reflected because I could have. I know some folk that will help me get rid of the body, so. <laughs> so. <laughs> I had a lot of friends in low places. But moving right along. <laughs> 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 
Move around. The, the Bible says in Acts chapter 6. Go. <laughs> There's a very thin line between policing and being a criminal. <laughs> it takes one to know one now. Come on, y'all, stop now. <laughs> Acts, where was that? Oh. <laughs> Acts chapter 6, verse 15. When Stephen was being stoned, the Bible says that at that particular time, that the glory of God was all over him and said his face shone like an angel. He was being stoned to death. I believe, I, now honestly, I believe with all my heart that when a saint is about to transition out of this world, they have the biggest smile. You may not be able to see it, but they have the biggest smile that any one person could ever have because they are about to see the king in person. Amen. Amen. So the Bible teaches us here that uh, when we suffer, it ought, to, it ought to be that we suffer as Christians and not as evildoers. Now, 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 nobody is going to ever escape the fiery trial, but you can escape the fiery judgment. Trials have to come because that's how we are purified. If there are no trials in our life, then we don't grow. Amen. Now, most of us have this, this elitist opinion that we have never done anything like that. Amen. I've never murdered anybody. I've never stolen anything of value. I only told white lies. No, too easy. I'm going to let that go. But Matthew tells us this in Matthew chapter 5. He, the Bible says in verse 21, it's very clear, he says, You have heard it said that those of, uh, those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, uh, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall uh, be in danger of hell fire. So what's he saying? He's saying that all of these things that we do in our heart, even if I haven't done them to you, you know what you thought about doing to me. So when you say, well, I would never do that, you know, I would never do that, but there are some stuff that you had thought about doing. And the only reason that you didn't do it is either because the opportunity didn't present itself or there was somebody interceding on your behalf to keep you from doing something that would cause your life to be in it forever. Amen. Isn't it wonderful sometimes to have Christian friends that can say, stop. And I don't mean just say, don't do that. No, stop. Now, if I need to knock you out, I'm not above that. that isn't that why you discipline your children? Huh? All right. So the Bible, <laughs> the Bible says that there are two kinds of folks in church. One are those who are who are trying to, to grow up in Christ, so they're going through some things. You all, that's why we always say, well, pastor, I'm going through. And I'm okay with that, but you don't need to keep going through. You ought to come out at some time. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. But what I'm saying to you is that uh, uh, there are other kinds of saints in church. We call them the church police. Amen. Now, the church police are always investigating or don't look at me like that. They trying to figure out what's up with you. Huh? 
You ever notice that most people never get delivered because you're trying to get them delivered from something they don't want to be delivered from? What does that mean? That means that you need to stop looking at people's situation and think you know what they're going through, and then you try to help them because that may not be what they want. Do you understand? So you meet a homeless person, they may want a bowl of soup, and you're trying to get them a house. Huh? And if they were honest, they would tell you, I don't, I don't no, I don't, I don't need a house. I can't pay no light bill. I ain't got no, but I do need some food. <laughs> but you being a busybody, not my words, the scripture, you want to help people that don't need your help. Pastor, how am I supposed to know when somebody needs my help? They will tell you. I need some help. Did they tell you they needed help? Well, Pastor, I saw how they, no, did they tell you they needed your help? So what's that about? You got to help everybody. That's because you want to feel good. It doesn't have anything to do with the person in their situation. You just want to feel good. If you have the Holy Spirit, they will direct you to the people who need your help. And those people will receive your help. That's why you find folk in church, you're always trying to give them stuff and they say, well, I really don't need that. Don't ever offer them anything else unless the Holy Spirit himself come in and push you. Say, go. Because they don't want you. You, oh, I got to get off of this. Do you know how many people go unhelped because you spend so much time trying to help somebody who don't want help? I got to go check on sister so-and-so. You know, I ain't seen her in church in a while. I, I got to go check on. Well, go check on two or three other people, too. Because it's obvious that sister so-and-so don't want to come to church. You done come there and blew the horn, knocked on the door, and she peeping through the blind pretending you. Amen. Sorry about that. No, listen, here's what the Bible defines as an evildoer. Please listen. It says an evildoer is a wicked man or one who is guilty of injustice and wrong towards others. It means properly an inspector of strange things. In other words, being nosy. Or of things of others in somebody else's business. It is someone who busies himself with what does not concern him. One more. It is one who pries into the affairs of another who attempts to control or direct them as though there were, they were his own. In other words, you want to handle somebody else's problem the way you would handle it. But that may not work for you. Y'all still? So then is it your position or your disposition? Here we go. That's the question. So is it my position or my, my position is that I'm a saint and I got to help everybody. Spoiler alert. Jesus said, I have to go to the father. So I can help everybody. You right here and you think you can help. This is not about not helping people. Don't get me wrong, because some of you will take some license with this. <laughs> what I am telling you is that if you are a Christian 
and you are suffering for righteous sake. What does that mean, righteous sake? I'm going to get to it in number two, but here's the deal. If you are suffering because you are, quote, working for the cause of Christ, then you are suffering righteous, and that is what we call a fiery trial. But when you're up in other people's business and yours is a mess, You're just setting yourself up for a fiery judgment. Okay, let me go on to number two. Question number two. Number one was a bust, right? Y'all ain't like that one. <laughs> Am I ashamed or glorifying Christ? Verse 16 says this, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory in this matter. So the Bible says not be ashamed is a negative and glorify God is a positive. It takes both to be a balanced witness. In other words, I, 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 have to, I have to feel uh, some shame, but not the shame of, of, of being uh, 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 an evil doer, but the shame of feeling conviction about what I'm doing. And it's positive to glorify God. In other words, here's what it means. When I come out of this situation, everybody's going to know it was God. Yes. And again, can I just be, as folks say, brutally honest? There's a few of you I probably would have cussed out 10 years ago. I didn't. I said, said could have. Sometime I even ask the Lord, Lord, I just need 10 minutes. But he wouldn't give it to me. Some of y'all, <sighs> y'all know I'm telling the truth. Okay. <laughs> now, in suffering, there's always a certain amount of this grace that comes with suffering. The reason that we become hypocrites, the reason we hide who we really are, is because we don't want anybody to see us suffer. You don't want anybody to see you going through. You want to pretend everything's all right. Well, how's it going? I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord. And right now you hungry and ain't got a pot or a window. And, and, see that side over there? Some, some up with it. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, you don't want nobody to know. You don't want nobody to know. No, listen to me. With suffering, there is a certain amount of disgrace you're just going to have to live with. You understand that? But why do I have to go through that? So that the glory of God can be manifested in you. How's the glory? Because I become the witness then. People see me going through. And when they see me going through, they know that I can come out of this. And I come out of this, come on, with the glory of God all over me. Are y'all understanding this? See, I remember when I used to sit on that very back pew back there because I couldn't go any further. And I was too weak to come this far. Amen. See, and everybody saw me suffering. Amen. Huh? I'm going to tell you like little, what is little Keith Wonderboy? Look at me now, look at me now. <laughs> but, 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 but. You need to understand that whatever you're going through, listen to me, whatever you're going through, nobody said it was going to be easy. <sighs> so he says this. You can't be ashamed of Christ when you're going through. 
And see, the first thing we do is when we start to have a problem is we start making excuses because, you know, because your friends will say, you know, and you call yourself a Christian. This is where you want to say, yeah, but I'm going to repent after I get you. Uh, no, that's a joke. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. I was just cheating. Don't do that. That's what you feel like, right? Now, here's what the... <laughs> oh, come on, y'all know I'm telling you some good stuff here now. I, you, you, you don't want to hear it, I understand. Now, 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 when Peter was writing this, you know this is First Peter, right? So when Peter was writing this, you know what Peter was thinking. Peter was thinking, I've been there. I've, I've seen this movie because I went through this. Huh? Peter said, hey, I know what it feels like to be ashamed. I know how to be disgraced. He said, I, I, I've seen this. Look at Luke chapter 22, verses 52 through 60, 54 to 62. I'm not going to read them all. It says uh, in verse 54, having been arrested, uh, having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now, now this this is one of uh, Jesus's closest allies. Now he's at a distance. Now, this is what I have always heard. Now, my, my pastor used to always say that you watch folk when they keep moving to the back of the church. So they positioning themselves for a seat outside. But, but that, that's a whole other story. Don't, in other words, don't follow, don't follow at a distance. It says... Uh, verse 55, now when they had uh, kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. So now Peter was no longer following Christ at a distance. Well, he was in the midst of evildoers. You see in this? The first thing that you do, come on, when fire and trials come your way and folks start to tell you, and see, if you weren't in church, you wouldn't be dealing with this. You know, if you didn't have to give church that money, you could have paid for this, and I wouldn't have to loan you any money. Oh, don't I just, uh. But anyhow, <laughs> y'all all heard this before, right? <laughs> the truth, <laughs> yeah, everybody's heard this. The truth of the matter is that if I'm going through something, and it's for the glory of God. I know it's going to build something good for my future. It's not about right now. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And I'm not going to read the rest of this with Peter because you know the story. You know what happened with Peter. Amen. But here's what I do want you to see. I want you to see that in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says this. Uh, but the heavens and the earth were preserved. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong, wrong page, wrong page. Oh, I got it in my Bible. I don't have to turn the page, do I? In uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, it says here in verse 6, here's what, this is the scripture I'm going to see. It says, therefore, it is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. It doesn't mean there won't be any shame, but it won't be ultimately a shameful thing. Therefore, to you who believe, to you who believe, to you who believe, the Bible says, the stone, uh, excuse me, therefore to you who believe, he is precious, but to those uh, who are disobedient, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. This is why folks have a problem embracing the gospel because they stumble over the scripture itself and it becomes an offense to them. Amen. But the Bible says, and I'm just going to give you these uh, scriptures and you just write them down in Hebrews uh, chapter two, verse 11. The Bible says the father was not ashamed to be called our God. Amen. Then the Bible says that in uh, Hebrews eleven sixteen, the Bible says, says uh, excuse me, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, it says, 11, 16, 
and in Mark, uh, Hebrews 12 and 2. I'm going to get all this together. I'm looking at all these numbers. My eyes are getting crossed. So on the cross, he said that he did not despise the shame that was before him. That was you and me. Amen. But, but now, now notice something. He says that, that uh, 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 we can be reproached and still not be ashamed. What does that mean, and not be ashamed? It means that stuff happens to us. It always does. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that we have, to, we have to lose out because we're going through it. Yeah. And, and too often, that's what happens to us. When we're going through something, we forget who we're supposed to be. I'm a child of God. I don't like it. I hate it when I can't answer you back. I, I am, listen, my blood pressure goes up. I had to get myself under control. When you say something stupid to me and I can't respond. You do some ignorant thing to me and I got to. But guess what? Guess what? Years of practice, years of practice, because y'all some good saints. Y'all grow your pastor up. Now, ain't time to, I'm just telling you the truth. <laughs> so now, I just be smiling, and in my mind, you know what I'm saying? Thou fool. Thou fool. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they say. Question number three. I saw what y'all did. <laughs> it got slick, right? No, <laughs> number three, am I seeking to win the loss? Now look at, look at verses 17 and 18 of the text today. The Bible says for, uh, the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. So it starts with us. And then it says, if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey God? Now, the Bible says this, that the loss, write this in your notes so you'll remember it. The loss are those who do not obey God. Amen. The loss are those who do not obey God. But pastor, I'm saved. Now, what did I just say? The loss are those who do not obey God. Amen. If you are saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled. You will obey God. Amen. Wait a minute. Didn't Samuel say that to Saul? Behold, to obey is. So now I'm going to say it to you. You're disobedient, but you call yourself a Christian. You can't follow. Listen now, you can't follow a simple command that's written in your Bible. It's not like somebody had to tell you. Oh, oh, now, wait a minute. Hold it. I don't remember hearing the benediction, but it sure got quiet up in here. <laughs> By this, all men will know you are my disciples, that you love one another. It's in your Bible. You don't need anybody to sit there and have a class on. You need to learn how to love. And I find myself teaching all the time. Love, love, love. There's something. Never mind. All right. Now, listen to this. I'll make two more points because I got to get through here. When a believer suffers, he experiences glory and he knows that they there will be a greater glory in the future. That's part of my change. That's part of my change. That's how I get to be who I am in Christ. But a sinner who causes that suffering is only filling up the measure of wrath. Listen, when God. Well, let's look at it scripturally. Matthew 23, Matthew 23, verse 29 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
because you build, uh, uh, build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of uh, the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. In other words, if I was around, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. <laughs> Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Look at verse 32. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. When you oppose righteousness, when you will come against people who are standing for right standing, then you are filling up the measure of your father's and it is also God's will that the measure of the thing that you mete out to someone is measured back to you. Amen. 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 Huh? What what that mean, Pastor? Well, that simply means that, uh, what they used to cheer and say, uh, I'm rubber, you glue or something. I'm, uh, yeah. Whatever you do bounces off me and sticks to you. Is that, that way it works? Now watch, because this is so important. And we had a lot of fun today so far. But do you not understand that some of the things that you are suffering right now are things that you did to somebody else? Come on. You did it. And now, because it's happening to you, you don't understand. I don't understand why I'm going through this. Because you did it to somebody else. Amen. And why does God allow that to happen? Well, for one thing, he wants you to understand that what you did was wrong and you need to fix it. Because you need to repent. Now, 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 stay with me and I got to, let me see if I can speed this up a little bit because they, I was teasing because they put the clock on me. See, I was okay there for about half the message. <laughs> so I'm going to jump way down here. Now, now <laughs> so, so here's the deal. Most saints honestly believe that what they did doesn't have anything to do with what they're doing. OK, so can I give you a quick case study? I want you to look in Genesis. You know, that's the beginning of everything. I simply believe that if you read Genesis, you'll know everything you need to know about the whole, the whole world. In Genesis chapter 19, there's a story about Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Y'all know the story? Well, you know this now, and I can tell you a little bit about the story, but you know from Lot's history, Lot's history, Lot's history, Lot was selfish. Huh? Lot wanted to go his own way, do his own thing. Y'all know Lot? Hmm? We find in Genesis, don't turn there, Genesis chapter 14, that Abraham, actually, after Lot separated from him, had to go get him, rescue him as a prisoner of war. Now, listen to what I just said. Lot was a prisoner of war, and Abraham had to rescue him. Now, I want you to think about today, when you are a prisoner of war, and it takes God's man to come get you. Somebody said, well, yeah, that ain't never happened. Yes, yes. Every time there's somebody on their knees praying for you, every time one of these uh, leaders are reaching out to you saying, come on, I need you to do this. This is God rescuing you. He's bringing you out. Are you following me? So we see in chapter 19 that the Lord had had enough. Had enough. Somebody say God has enough. See, sometimes this is what happened to us, you know. We just, remember what I just said, we fill up the Father's wrath. It comes to that point in time where 
God says, no, 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 I, I'm not going to let you keep doing this. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So beginning at verse 12. Now, I can't, I can't read all of this because uh, the clock is ticking. Amen. So here's what we know. The Bible says that uh, these men said to Lot, have you, in, has you, is anybody else here? And he told him, no, you know, and he said, in verse 12 says, for we will destroy this place. Because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. There's a point in time when disobedience will mature. My mom used to always say, you can get by, but you can't get away. Amen. And see, some of y'all don't know what that means. And, and thank God for you that don't know what it means. But I can tell you this. Uh, folks say uh, everything that, what is it, karma? Uh, everything, what goes around, yeah, uh, yeah. So here in Genesis, the Bible says that the angels came to warn Lot. What did they tell Lot? Here's what they told Lot. Lot, now I'm talking to you now. I'm talking to y'all, Lot. You Lot today. Lot, you are out of the will of God. And what does he mean by that? He said you're out of the will of God. Why? Because we have already rescued you one time. And rather than you learning something from that warning, you went right back. To the same people. Come on, some of y'all still got the same friends. I don't want to talk about them because I can't do that. That would be ungodly of me to talk about them. But some of you still hanging with the same people. You've been in trouble with these people. Come on. And when you got in trouble, it took somebody from outside your circle of influence to deliver you. And then you went right back to those same uh, different people. And some of y'all kept going back. Come on. You know I'm right. <sighs> so he warned him. He said, you're out of the will of God. God's had enough. Now, but God, God, he, he likes you a lot. So, so, you know. <laughs> so the Bible said, Listen. Now, I want you to write this down just like I said to you because you need to remember this. God was able, but Lot was not willing. Hmm? This is us. This is us. We know that God is able, but we're just unwilling to change. So here it is. Let me, let me read it to you because I'm, I'm running out of time. It says here, he first lingered, verse 16. He hung around when he should have been gone. Verse 16 says, and while he lingered, then the Bible says that he argued with the angel. Well, can't I go someplace else? Huh? That's verse 18. Then verse 19 says that he begged, please let me go over here to Zul. Are y'all still with me? So the Bible says that finally he resisted. The angel had to take them by the hand and pull them away from the impending fire. You know, uh, let me talk to some parents. Can I talk to some parents for just a moment? You know how you tell your children. That boy ain't no good. You need to get away from that girl. Hmm? I'm telling you right now, I've seen this before, and he, I'm telling you exactly what he's going to do now. I'll tell you exactly what she's going to do. Yup, yup. Truth is, you just tell them what you did, so you...
so. Come on, 1 Corinthians, <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verses 9. Now, I don't have time to read all this, but write it down, and you can read it later on. But the Bible says that when Lot was led out, he was saved as by fire, and everything he lived for went up in smoke. Now, here's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians. It says that we are fellow workers with Christ. It says, and notice this, it says in verse 12, and I'm skipping, it says, Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, straw, each one's will be, uh, work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by what? Fire. And the fire will what? Test each one's work. That's why you go through what you're going through so your work can be tested. And the Bible says if anyone works which he builds on endures, he will receive award. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. Lot. But he himself was what? Saved. Yet as through the fire. See, sometimes when you're living a life of foolishness and you're pretending to be saved, the Bible says that what happens is that all the stuff that you claim to be good, your good works get burned up. And let me tell you something. I just read an article in the paper just yesterday. It says, uh, not as editorial, it says, why is the church shrinking? And the reason the church is shrinking is because you don't have any works left. There ain't nothing for you to pass on. You didn't live a life so that folk could live on after you so that when you died, everything, it burned up. And the only thing that got saved was you. And that's by the grace of God, because you call yourself a Christian. Amen. Are y'all understanding this? Now. Whew, I'm probably going to have to finish this next week, but I'm going to just give you some some illustrations here, because. The reason that you're going through what you're going through is because you have made repentance a change of mind and not a change of heart. You made it a change of mind. I'm not going to do that anymore. You know what that means? You're doing it under your own power. That's why you say, I'm not smoking anymore. I'm not drinking anymore. I'm not going to sleep around anymore. I'm not doing any more drugs. You going? Yeah, you will. Because you had a change of mind, but you didn't have a change of heart. And what I'm going to tell you is this. If you look at in Ezekiel chapter 36, the Bible will tell you very clear in, in verses 26 and 27, which I don't have time to go through. But the Bible says that if you want to be able to prevent these problems and you want to see a change, then the Bible says to you, you must not only have a new heart, but you must have a new spirit. You must have a new spirit in you that ministers to your heart so that it is different. And if there's no change there, you won't change. And when you won't change, then the first time a fiery trial comes, you will fail. Amen. Amen. So the issue, and I'll finish this next week, the issue is the heart. Romans 10 and 10 says that with the heart, man believes. It's with the heart. I've got to have a new heart so that I can believe God. Amen. Amen. And what happens is that we, we don't change the way our heart functions. You listen, if you're having a problem, stand up on your feet. I come on, I, I'm running out of time. No, I'm not going to be disobedient. <laughs> If you're having issues with your behavior, it's because you're having a heart problem. Amen. You understand this? Change your heart, you'll change your behavior. Change your heart, you'll change what you believe. Come on. But you've got to change your heart. James chapter 4 verse 8 says that you have to draw near to God, cleanse your hands, and Purify your heart. Purify, listen, in the Old Testament, purify means to rit ritually clean. 
In other words, the priest had to always wash, sprinkle with blood. That was cleansing. But today it's called repentance. I confess my sin and I get rid of it. And the Bible says I purify my heart. There are so many things that I can drop off now because I have the power of the Holy Spirit working in me. So every time I face a fiery trial, that's God's delivering me to his will. Do you understand? He is delivering me to his will. This is my will for you. You can't do that. You can't hang with them, folks. That's why the more, longer you stay with them, the more you're going to have issues with them. You're going to be at odds with them because they are not your people. Y'all still with me here? <laughs> so, I said I was there. Can I give you one more scripture? 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Hallelujah. Bible says in verse one, therefore, having these promises, do you, you have any, any promises? Beloved, kinship, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And that's what we need to do this morning. Got to have a new heart. Got to have a new spirit. You have got to be a different person. What does that mean? That means that I have to understand that everything that happens to me is for the purpose of God making me into his image. And because he's bringing me closer to that, to that, that image, then I can take it. I can take it. Even if it is unto death, I can still take it. Are you understanding? The spirit and heart is to serve you. Purify their hearts. Change them now from the inside out. Allow them to understand that every test that comes into their life, every fiery trial is designed to bring them closer to the image of your son, Christ. God, I'm asking you now to forgive us from, for every sin, overt, covert, everything that happened to us that was not your will. God, forgive us now. We repent and we ask you to cleanse us. Make us strong, mighty. Give us the ability to do exploits in your kingdom. And God will give you praise for it now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We pray that you enjoyed today's service. Listen, guys, Bishop did it again with another amazing word. We hope you got something out of it. But before we get out of here today, there might be one who's watching who has not yet had the opportunity to accept Christ as your personal savior. I wanna extend that opportunity to you right now. It's as simple as ABC. First, admit that you're a sinner. Secondly, believe that Christ died for your sins. And thirdly, confess that he's Lord of your life. It's just that simple. So if that's something you wanna do, repeat this prayer after me. Say, Father, I confess that I am a sinner. I have fallen short of your glory. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. Be my savior. And I will forever serve you. Right now, I declare that I am saved. I am a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, guys, that's it. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the kingdom. We're so excited. The angels in heaven are rejoicing. Listen, if you'll do me a favor and you would uh, message us, message us with the word saved. 
we will get in contact with you and we will pray with you and make sure that you have somebody who you can team up with, call on and have a partner in this journey. We want to make sure that all of us make it to the other side so we can rejoice in the kingdom. Listen, guys, we have enjoyed this time with you. Um, thank you again for being with us today. Our prayer is that this blessed you in some way, shape, or form. Um, and as you get out of here, have a great and awesome week. And just by chance, if your week isn't so awesome, make sure that it has an awesome you. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.